This video was made possible through the support of my patrons. As far as I'm concerned, this is the big one. This is the Doctor Who Lost Holy Grail, the story that, out of everything from the show's black and white era, is the one that brings me the most pain that it wound up being junked or lost forever. Marco Polo, an epic seven-part story to really hit home the historical, educational nature of the show that BBC head of drama Sidney Newman wanted Doctor Who to be. The second commissioned script for the show, Sidney Newman brought in one of the writers he worked with on The Avengers for ABC, John Lucarotti and tasked him to write about one of his favourite subjects, The Travels of Marco Polo. Having previously written an 18-part radio series about his travels, Lucarotti was asked to apply that knowledge of Yuan Dynasty China, or Cathay, to this humble sci-fi show. So starting where the Edge of Destruction left off, the Doctor, Susan, Barbara and Ian have landed on the Pamir Mountains, the roof of the world, in 1289. However, the TARDIS is broken, with the Doctor needing a few days to repair some vital components. In order to avoid freezing to death, the group join the caravan of explorer Marco Polo, played by Mark Eden, who is travelling across the fabled Silk Road to see the Emperor Kublai Khan. However, Marco commandeers the TARDIS and its key keys from the Doctor, with the hope of giving it to the Emperor as a gift in exchange for passage back home to Europe. The serial takes place over the course of several weeks and months, as the caravan travels across China, but treachery is afoot, as warlord Tegana, played by Darren Nesbitt, has infiltrated the caravan posing as a peace emissary, and is sabotaging Marco's efforts. But to what end, and can our TARDIS team survive the treacherous journey and get the TARDIS back? Now let's address the elephant in the room here. This story has been lost to time. It was one of many BBC shows to be routinely junked during the 1960s and the 1970s, the earliest story, the earliest episodes in Doctor Who's history to not survive in the archives. Ironically, however, because of the story's reception and subject matter, it was one of the most sold stories from the BBC to other territories and broadcasters. And the fact that no episodes survive in spite of all of this means that Marco Polo could very well be the most destroyed story in Doctor Who history. Don't you go. Stop! Stop! He's already dead. However, because of the incredible behind the scenes work from the sets and the costuming, it's the most photographed classic Doctor Who story, with dozens upon dozens of high quality photos allowing us to see what this story could have looked like, including many colour photos. We also have telesnaps, which are off air photos that are often commissioned by TV directors as a record of their work. In this case, an unearthly child director, Waris Hussein, though there are no off air photos for part four, because because Waris Hussein took the week off, and John Crockett took over, and he did not commission telesnaps. These visual resources, as well as off-air recordings from David Holman and James Russell, means that we've had telesnap recreations, both official, with a 30-minute abridged version of the story appearing on DVD, and unofficial black and white and even colour versions from Loose Cannon, as well as official audio-only releases from the BBC. I watched and listened to all of these for the purposes of this review. I should also mention at this time that having watched Marco Polo about four times, I really like it. This story feels like an epic adventure in the truest sense of the word, with our characters not locked to one setting and constantly moving forward towards peaking. A straight line distance of around two and a half thousand miles, but obviously the journey isn't that simple. The nature of the story is episodic, with most episodes taking place at rest stops or interludes of the journey, but you never lose the sense of scope, mainly thanks to some lovely bits of frequent narration from Marco Polo, who is keeping a diary of the trip, speaking over map footage, showing their progress. Success. My plan has worked. The strangers and their unusual caravan accompany me to Lop. Our route takes us across the roof of the world, down to the Kashgar Valley and southeast to Tarkand. Here we join the old Silk Road, along which the commerce and culture of a thousand years has travelled to and from Cathay. I wonder... What 
the stranger's reaction will be when I tell them what I propose to do. Now, it's a bit of a stretch that this single component that the Doctor has to fix to get the TARDIS working again controls almost literally everything else about the ship. For example, they can't use it to get food or water for the journey, but it's a discrepancy that's worth swallowing for the sake of the overarching narrative. And I love centering the TARDIS in this story as the main goal for our lead characters. Obviously, if it reaches Kublai Khan, there is no way he'll be able to operate it, but it's the only way for our leads to escape and get back home. Marco Polo is not a savage caveman, or a Dalek mutant incapable of empathy, but someone who needs to be negotiated with. One reason the story lasts as long as it does is that Ian, Barbara, the Doctor and Susan need to get him on side and let them know that they can be trusted, which is difficult when Tagana is trying to hinder their efforts. He comes into the story with an already established goal, but these travellers who he regards as evil spirits from a magic box are going to impede him. He's a malleable villain whose first plan of trying to poison the caravan is interrupted by a sandstorm, so instead empties all but one of the water girds. It's a constant back and forth, where our protagonists try to earn the favour of Marco and convince him to give them their ship back, but Tagana makes it difficult by casting suspicion on the newcomers. But one way our heroes can earn favour with Marco is with their enhanced knowledge. Now, they come from the future, but the story does not use this as a crux for why characters like Ian and the Doctor are resourceful, like they don't show Marco their magical wristwatches or something. Instead, they use their modern knowledge of science and apply it to things that are still applicable to the present, like putting bamboo on a fire, causing it to explode so they can scare bandits away, or using the condensation on the TARDIS walls for water. Now, if there's one character who kind of gets the short straw here, it's Susan, but she still gets some lovely scenes with Ping Cho, and with them both being 16-year-old girls, they naturally talk all about boys. Well, I thought Mr. Marco said that you were going to Shang too. Are you on holiday? No, Kubla Khan Summer Palace is in Shangtu. I am going there to be married. What? Well, how old are you? I am in my 16th year. Well, so am I. Do you marry at our age in your land? Here it is the custom. Is your fiancé handsome? My what? Your... The man you're going to marry. I have never seen him. What? The marriage has been arranged by my family. I know only two things about him. Well, what are they? He's a very important man. Well, that's a good start. <laughs> and he's 75 years old. <gasps> now, Ping Cho, played by Xenia Merton, is actually based on a real-life person who Marco Polo travelled with for an arranged marriage, Princess Kokachin, and Ping Cho's story even has the same ending. That's because this serial, for the most part, does steer pretty close to the actual travels and the methods of Marco Polo and his caravan, with a couple of exceptions, like Marco's father and his uncle are nowhere to be seen despite travelling with him during this time period. Now, the story does stop every so often so that characters, mostly Ian, can start educating Susan about the time period. When did you leave Shengdu? Yesterday, my lord. Yesterday? What? Well, that's 300 miles away, isn't it? We change horses every league, my lord. Every league? That's the reason we wear these, my lord. To warn the post house of our arrival. When we get there, a fresh horse is saddled and waiting, ready for the next three miles. And you ride without rest until you reach your destination? Yes, my lady. I would have thought it was a physical impossibility. Our bodies would be shaken to pieces, my lord, were it not for these. Bound tight like this one on my head. Tell me. Are there many men who can ride such long distances without a break? We are few, my lord. 300 miles a day on horseback. Very few people can ride more than 25. It's in our blood, my lord. We all come from the great steppes to the north. But it never goes too far into outright lecturing. And to be fair to this scene, considering how far the caravan has travelled so far, the group are probably wondering how couriers can travel so far in so short a time. In terms of pacing, Marco Polo is... Leisurely. That's not to say there aren't moments of action or danger, but for the most part, it's a story that's very methodically paced, and for what it's worth, I was never bored for the duration, because it actually earns its seven-episode length. The story continues to escalate the tension between Marco and the rest of the group, with part four having Marco actually use his authority to seize the TARDIS and impose a potential penalty on the group. Bear witness. 
I wear the gold seal of Kublai Khan. And by the authority it invests in me, I do hereby seize and hold your caravan in his name. Be warned. Any resistance to this decree is instantly punishable by death. You poor, pathetic, stupid savage. And to be honest, it's hard to find Marco to be unreasonable. Yeah, he's desperate to get home, but he's open to trusting the TARDIS group, but he keeps getting lied to because they won't tell him where they're really from. It means that by the end, when Ian finally admits that they're time travellers, Marco can't accept it. And it's such a wonderfully portrayed scene from William Russell and Mark Eden. And for additional context, Marco takes the TARDIS key from the group and he hides it in his journal. Ping Cho gives them the key back, but when caught, Ian takes the fall for it. So he has the key, but he doesn't know where it came from. And it's this sequence of events that casts Marco's ultimate doubt on him. On my travels to Cathay, um, I have come to believe many things which I previously doubted. For instance, when I was a boy in Venice, they told me that in Cathay there was a stone which burned. I did not believe them, but there is such a stone. I have seen it. It's black, black isn't it? Yes. Cold. In Cathay we call it the burning stone. And if a stone burns, why not a caravan that flies? Birds fly. I have even seen fish that fly. You are asking me to believe that your caravan can defy the passage of the sun? Move not merely from one place to another, but from today into tomorrow, today into yesterday? Oh, no, Ian. That I cannot accept. Marco's a really great character to focus this story on, the first Doctor Who historical figure, and Eden's performance imbues him with a great presence and humility. But ultimately, he shares the same motivation as our main group, to get home again, regardless of the journey. With the culmination of the story finding everyone at the Palace of Kublai Khan, and he's just an old pottering man who gets on the wrong side of the doctor because the doctor is unable to bow because his back gives out. And no, I'm not making that up. Do you mock our affliction? It's my back. What is it? It's broken. Don't be impertinent. I am not being impertinent, sir. I'm far from unwell. How dare you speak out? I am shut. But then, the two find loads of common ground and become best mates and they play each other at backgammon. In fact, the Doctor is so good at the game that he literally wins half of Asia. Then Kublai Khan's wife, the Empress, enters, asks her husband if he's winning, son, and then just goes about her day. Again, I am not making any of this up. Winning, my love? One wins, one loses, my dear. The great crown is far too modest, my lady. You're not <laughs> wagering, are you? You know how it affects your gout. <clears throat> It's such a riot. One of my favourite Hartnell moments in this story is in part one, when the TARDIS is taken away from him and they have to get roped into this journey across China and the Doctor has a full-on laughing fit. My mind is made up. Your caravan goes with me to Kublai Khan. <laughs> come on, come and sit down. Who makes one bet? Grandfather! It's Kublai Khan, he says. Why are you laughing? He means it. Doctor, he's scary. I, I know he is, yes. What are you going to do? I have the faintest idea. It's so random and unprompted that the official classic Doctor Who website has this listed as a goof. Maybe it was unscripted, technically making it an error, I guess, but considering the past four stories have all led into each other, maybe this is just the Doctor at his absolute wit's end, and he can't help but laugh about it. Hartnell was ill during the filming of part two, so he only appears in one scene and only has one line, so maybe he really was at his wit's end after the last episode, who knows. However, while the Doctor's absence in part two is felt, his lines were given to Barbara, resulting in this beautiful scene between Barbara and Susan. Well, you know him better than I do, but 
I'd have said he was just feeling defenseless. He has a wonderful machine capable of all sorts of miracles. It's taken away from him by a man he calls a primitive. Look, TARDIS is the only home we have at the moment. And when we're in it, we feel safe and secure. But when we're out of it... He talked to me. Confide in me. Oh, he's like a rubber ball. He'll come bouncing out of there soon, full of ideas. One day, we'll know all the mysteries of the skies. Stop our wondering. But yeah, at the end, the Doctor bets the TARDIS in a game of backgammon and unfortunately loses. Though the Doctor is gifted a piece of Kublai Khan's paper currency and also a walking stick with a snake engraved into it, which would be the Doctor's walking stick of choice for the rest of his on-screen tenure. Honestly, because the structure of Marco Polo is so loose, it's kind of hard to talk about it as a whole without just describing wonderful scenes from it. It's just a buffet of brilliant moments and character beats, one after the other. In terms of issues I have with it, I, I thought that Tagana was maybe a bit bland. Though to be fair, I'm not able to watch the story in its full proper context. Maybe if I saw the actor's performance, I could maybe endear to him a bit more. I just think that maybe the story could have revealed that Tagana was the saboteur a bit later on. We find out by the first episode's cliffhanger, meaning that the serial gets a bit repetitive. Watching Tagana set up a trap, our heroes escape from it and... Okay, we'll do that again next week. I'm not even sure why Tagana wants to sabotage the caravan and kill Marco Polo if he's instrumental in him reaching Kublai Khan in the first place. But then, when Tagana gets an opening to kill the Emperor, he bloody misses! What a loser! And speaking of repetitive, it seems like 90% of the plans in this serial get ruined because someone overheard something being planned or spoken about. By the fifth time it happens, I'm surprised that no one starts just whispering their goals and their plans anymore. It does stretch credibility. There's also the aspect of unfortunate yellow face in this story, with most of the actors playing characters of Asian descent in this serial being Caucasian and adopting variations of yellow face. Now, the story rarely descends into mockery or full-blown parody, but it's still not an acceptable thing to do in almost any context. The only character who the team sought out to be played by an actual Asian actor was Ping Cho, and even then, Waris Hussein wanted someone who was not in the West End show The World of Susie Wong or the film 55 Days at Peking, massive productions at the time that were using predominantly Asian actors. But it meant that Waris Hussein and the rest of the creative team intentionally limited their pool of actors, Maybe it made sense at the time, I don't know, but looking back it seems like a really unnecessary handicap that does date the serial, which is a shame because most of the characters are really textured and well written with wonderful dialogue in a great story. Tristam Carey's music as well unfortunately is also lost so there's no isolated score for Marco Polo to exist either, but it is brilliant. This guy did the music for the Daleks and the creepy synths and radiophonic tense underscoring is instead replaced by Grand instrumentation. Basically, get you a guy who can do both. There's some effective and fitting Eastern-inspired music from the BBC Stock Library, but the original compositions add a lot to the mood and further hit home the idea of this being an epic adventure. There's really no other way to describe Marco Polo, other than a country-spanning, epic. A tour de force production feat, where the production team were able to make a few studio sets in Ealing into 13th century China. From the group battling sandstorms, facing hordes of bandits, meeting the Emperor of China and camping under the stars, it's a far cry from Ian and Barbara spending two episodes trying to jump over a four-foot gap in the Daleks just weeks prior. I think Tagana is a pretty ho-hum villain, and it could have mixed up the story structurally a bit more, but I also acknowledge that maybe I'd feel different about it if this story was still here, and I could actually see the incredible sets and costumes in motion. Waris Hussein and John Crockett did a great job engendering real peril and pathos into John Lucarotti's character-rich script, and the result is a classic in all senses of the word, and it truly breaks my heart that it's seemingly gone forever. But if I saw it, would I believe it? What is the truth? I wonder where the episodes are now. Stuck in the past or discoverable in the future? 
Anyway, enough waxing lyrical, join us next time, where Terry Nation returns for a set of mini sci-fi adventures that will see our explorers face off against the Vord, survive the harsh tundra, escape devilish forests, and even a courtroom battle in The Keys of Marinus. I'll see you next time. So I hope that answers your question, what's Mr. Tider's going to do about lost stories for these marathons? For these reviews, telesnaps are going to be the way to go, but I do also listen to the audiobook version in order to get a full comprehensive experience, or at least as much of one as I can possibly get. If you enjoyed this review of Marco Polo, be sure to hit the like button, leave a comment down below, appease the almighty YouTube algorithm, and also subscribe to keep up to date on all future videos. I also want to thank one of my patrons in particular this week. Now my patrons do help to keep the lights on here by supporting my channel, but Evil Dalek 79 has helped me out with this marathon by pointing me in the direction of where I can get the best music sources for these classic soundtracks. As I mentioned in the review, the Marco Polo soundtrack has been lost, so a lot of things have had to be cobbled together, but thank you to Evil Dalek 79 for making that job an awful lot easier. But speaking of patrons, if you'd like to become one, check out all of the links in the description below. We've got a Mr. Tardis Discord server that you can be a part of. You get these reviews in some cases several months early. You can see their names scrolling down now, and I want to give a shout out to these particular particular patrons. Adam Gratton, Angus Bajarnison, Callum Baird, Chiva City Blues, Dan the Dreamer Schill, Daniel Davis, Darren Carver Bausiger, Dean Jones, Dr. Hadley, Dragon Bugs, Dylan Whitaker, Evil Dialect 79, Finley Rude, Flipmeister MK, Ginger Animator, Hunter Graham, Jack D. Evans, James Ivory, Jared Saylor, Joseph Adams, Leela, Mario Fanboy 15, Matthew Perry, Michael Serrano, Miranda Logan, Nate Harris, Nathaniel Holden, Palex, Raven Woods, Reese Lloyd, Ross, Samuel Whitaker, Steve Fiore, Taylor Wooderson, The Brit Sniper, The Doctor 14 Blu-ray Reviews, Timbo1834, Toby Loxton, Will, Zabi555, and Strange Folk. Thanks so much to all my patrons, thanks to you for sticking around towards the very end of this video, and I'll see you all next time.